Karen Oppenheim Mason completed her PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago in 1970. She spent the next 20 years in the sociology faculty at the University of Michigan and then in 1991 moved to Hawaii to become the director of the program on population at the East West Center. From 1991 through 2004, she also was a member of the sociology department at the University of Hawaii. In 1997, while at the East West Center, she was elected the president of the Population Association of America and presented this article as her presidential address at the annual PAA conference that year. In 2004, Mason left Hawaii for a position at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where she served for eight years before returning to the East-West Center as an adjunct senior fellow in 2012. In 2011, Mason received the Harriet Presser Award from the PAA for her record of sustained research contributions to the study of gender and demography. This article, published in 1997, added a much needed element of flexibility to what had become a rather rigid debate about exactly how to view the process of demographic transition from high to low birth and death rates. Its most important contribution is the idea that there is no one-size-fits-all model of demographic transition. Mason made the practical observation that due to the great diversity of conditions in which demographic changes began in different societies around the world, we must think in terms of not just one, but many different versions of demographic transitions. There are different paths of change that can all lead to the same outcome of low birth and death rates. This idea has proved again and again to be important and valuable in understanding demographic change. In the second half of the 20th century, and even for some years before that, scholars were trying to make sense of the dramatic demographic changes taking place in the world around them. Not only had death rates fallen dramatically in many countries, as discussed in previous readings, but in some countries, birth rates also started to drop. Why was this happening? Different explanations were offered by different writers until the literature on fertility decline became crowded with debate and alternative perspectives. Toward the end of the century, then, it seemed to Mason that the time had come to try to sum up all this variety of views and to try to make some coherent sense of the complicated debate. She begins with what we might call the mainstream of thinking on the subject. The dominant explanation for why birth rates fall was very similar to the explanation offered for why death rates fall, sometimes by the same writers in both cases. The drop in both kinds of vital rates usually was linked to the larger idea of social and economic development, including the expanding scale of markets and production, increasing wealth in societies, the growth of industrial factory production, and the population of factory workers who lived in cities instead of on farms, and also the rise of the social luxury of mass education that went hand in hand with this development. This classic version of transition theory even had a place for the previous subject of mortality decline, also linked to development. If death rates fall, particularly for infants, people can reach any particular desired family size by having fewer births, since they will not lose so many of them before the babies can grow up, so mortality decline itself could perhaps lead to fertility decline also mentions another kind of explanation built on top of the classical transition explanation. This has become known as second demographic transition theory. We can think of this perspective as an add-on supplement to the main development argument. It does not dispute that main argument or seek to refute it. Instead, this direction of thinking suggests that after the main transition reaches a certain level of prosperity and freedom in societies, and after birth rates already have declined considerably, Birth rates are then affected by a new focus on the personal self-fulfillment of individuals rather than making decisions on the basis of larger household and family groups. This individualization of people's decision-making can lead to more births happening outside marriage, to alternative kinds of relationships instead of marriages, and sometimes to continued declines in birth rates to levels that are not even sufficient to sustain a population. Since this add-on theory about fertility is built on top of the original mainstream perspective, we can think of it as an extension of that earlier explanation. Another important innovation in how we think about falling birth rates came from Jack Caldwell in Australia, 
as we will see in future readings. He was concerned about one aspect of the older mainstream theory in particular, the idea that before birth rates begin to fall, when fertility remains high in traditional societies, people are not thinking logically about their reproductive behavior. The development theorists who lived in the USA and Europe and who wrote most or all of the original development explanation articles tended to think about people in their own society as the enlightened, rational ones who were doing things that made good logical sense. This included participating in competitive market economies and also in making conscious decisions about all aspects of their lives, including choices about getting married and having babies that would give each person the most benefits or what economists call utility. This utility, as you might expect in societies dominated by cash economies, usually boils down to a question of how each individual person might make as much money as possible. From this perspective, if having too many children cramps your style and prevents you from getting ahead in your career, you should recognize this and have fewer children. It is only a short step from this idea of a trade-off between money and children as a rational choice to another less obvious idea. If the modern people with low birth rates living in developed societies are the rational ones, then maybe traditional people with high birth rates living in less developed societies are being irrational. Maybe they are having too many births because they are not thinking clearly about how all those children could be holding them back. Maybe they are blinded by age-old customary habits of living and thinking in these traditional societies. If we could just wake them up to a rational outlook, they wouldn't have all those babies. This is the ethnocentric view that Caldwell could not swallow. Based on his own field work in Africa and Asia, he argued instead that all people in all cultures are well aware of the costs and benefits of their actions, and that the decisions they make in traditional as well as modern settings are rational ones that make perfect sense to them. Nobody is irrational and blinded by tradition. Caldwell saw that in some societies like ours, children are expensive liabilities in economic terms because wealth generally flows downward from parents to children. The more children you have, the more wealth you have to give up as a parent to support them. This, of course, makes small families a rational choice, just as the development theorists suggested. But in many traditional cultures, wealth generally flows in the opposite direction instead, from children to parents. Parents control the wealth produced by their children. So the more children you have, the more wealth you gain and control. In such a situation, large families can be a rational choice instead. Caldwell thought that the ethnocentrism of earlier development theorists, in fact, had blinded them, so that they couldn't see that in some times and places, children were valuable resources instead of expensive liabilities. Another perspective mentioned by Mason often goes by the label of rational choice theory. This is the extreme form of the rationality idea just mentioned in connection with Caldwell's wealth flows argument. Surely everyone can agree that there are some choices in life when people sit back and take a careful, objective look at the situation and then choose the alternative that will give the best outcome for them, the most personal utility. Rational choice theory simply extends this idea to everything that people do in their lives. Do you try taking drugs as a young student in school? Do you have unprotected sex and catch a sexually transmitted disease or get pregnant? Do you quit your job and look for a new one? Do you get married? Do you get divorced? Rational choice theory tries to view every choice you make as a logical decision where you weigh the pros and cons and then carefully choose the right alternative so that you'll get the best result in the future. Rational choice theory thus represents one extreme form of the traditional development explanation for lower birth rates, concentrating on the details of how social and economic changes are translated into changes in reproductive motivation and behavior. It may be useful with respect to this rational choice perspective to remember that Malthus gave up on that idea that people are purely rational beings over two centuries ago and recognized that real people are a mixture of rational beings and creatures governed by their passions. Yet another adjustment or modification that has been made to this mainstream development explanation for fertility decline concentrates on what Mason referred to as the costs of birth control. Even if people are balancing pros and cons about having a baby, and even if such calculations tell them that the disadvantages outweigh the advantages and they probably should avoid the birth, 
how should they accomplish this avoidance? This may not be as easy as it sounds. So long as people insist on having sex lives, and this probably isn't going to change, the most natural result is pregnancy and birth. Special steps must be taken to avoid births. And these special steps may involve costs. Mason mentions two different types of such costs. The actual economic costs, such as paying for contraceptives or a vasectomy, which might be very high in some cases when access to these technologies is missing in a particular locality, and what she calls the social costs. If one society views abortion as illegal and a sin, the social costs are higher than if another society views it as just another medical procedure freely available to anyone. This adjustment to the mainstream theory adds in consideration of such practical barriers to using methods of fertility control and how they vary from one society to another. Finally, Mason considers an explanation of fertility control that introduces a more radical alternative to the mainstream development explanation rather than simply extending or adjusting it. This is usually called the diffusion explanation. The heart of this explanation holds that new ways of thinking and behaving, once they appear in one place for some reason, can spread to other populations, much like an influenza virus or a popular piece of music. The diffusion explanation does not completely replace the mainstream development theory because it does not explain how the original innovation happens. But once that has happened someplace for the first time, this perspective argues that later marriages, new attitudes about contraceptives, and all other aspects of attitudes and behavior that lead to falling birth rates can be borrowed across social groups. This means that fertility decline can take place in communities that do not experience urbanization or industrialization or rising wealth and prosperity or more formal schooling, as long as such communities are in social contact somehow with other places where birth rates have already declined. Such diffusion theories have long posed the primary alternative and threat to any sort of evolutionary theory that regards change as a process unfolding according to some internal dynamic within a system or society itself. The distinction is whether we see change as caused from within the system changing or from outside that system. Having laid out all these different theoretical perspectives that try to explain fertility decline, Mason then compares each of them to how that process of falling birth rates actually has happened in different times and places. Which theory fits best when we look at what has actually happened? After summing up all the different explanations that she found to explain declining birth rates, Mason arrived at two important conclusions about this collection of theories. First, each of them contained important ideas, but left out other ideas contained in other explanations. Second, and more troubling, each of these theories that was concrete enough to actually make predictions about how and when birth rates decline had turned out not to fit at least one example of actual falling fertility. These two conclusions led her to identify what she viewed as four errors in how we think about the whole question. Probably we should not be surprised to find that the first error she suggests is the error of assuming that all transitions have the same cause. It would be nice, of course, if there was only one simple story to tell about falling birth rates, a story that had all the same characters and plot and turned out the same way in every situation around the world. However, this is a little like expecting that the movie stars who end up as true lovers in each other's arms at the end of many motion pictures all got to those closing credits through the same plot, the same script in every case. Mason tells us to give up this unrealistic expectation and to admit that birth rates can decline for quite different reasons in different times and places. Sometimes one theory or explanation may be the best fit, while at other times one of the other explanations may fit the facts better. This raises an interesting point for her. As she says on page 446, because no single cause can explain all fertility declines, few events or conditions are likely to be either necessary or sufficient for a fertility decline. This leads her to an unusual explanatory approach, what we might call the critical mass approach to explaining demographic change. If we recognize that there are many different factors that contribute to the start and then to the continuation of fertility decline, then perhaps it is not so much a question of whether one particular factor is present or absent in a society, 
but rather how many such factors are all present together, able to combine to produce the critical mass to start the process of transition. It may help to visualize a balance scale. On one side, we have the heavy demographic weight of a high birth rate, producing a large share of the population found in the youngest ages as dependents requiring a lot of help and support. The balance scale is tipped to that side by the weight of all those births. But as we begin to add one possible explanatory factor after another to the other side of the scale, the balance eventually begins to shift. The birth side of the scale rises up, which we can think of as a lower birth rate and a lighter burden of young dependents. We can pile different combinations of explanatory factors on the other side of the scale and produce lower birth rates in a variety of different ways, depending on the underlying conditions that encourage or block each of the possible influences identified by all those different theories. So in general, Mason's approach removes the problem that no one factor or explanation always works in every case of fertility decline that we can find to examine. Even though no one factor is necessary or sufficient by itself, we can still say that some critical mass of such factors must combine to become both necessary and sufficient to produce a transition. But she makes one exception to this general rule that no one factor is either necessary or sufficient by itself to produce a transition. There is one factor which she suggests, on second thought, might actually be necessary to get lower birth rates. This factor is mortality decline and more specifically, lower risks of death for infants and children. She pays a lot of attention to this factor, partly because she feels that many of the theories that she reviewed at the start seem to have forgotten to include it as part of the explanation, and partly because in all of the literature that she reviewed documenting fertility decline around the world, this one factor does seem to show up on the balance scale every time as one of the conditions that start the process. While better child survival can't produce a fertility decline all by itself, she doesn't find cases where birth rates fell without finding this factor on the other side of the balance. This does not mean that any time we see improvement in child survival, birth rates will go down. It is necessary, but not sufficient. But it does mean that every time we see birth rates go down, Mason thinks that we will find better child survival on the other side of the scale, along with other possible explanations needed for that critical mass. The third mistake that she points out is the same mistake that Caldwell pointed out in his theory about the reversal of the direction of wealth flows across generations. Here Mason is validating Caldwell's extension of the mainstream transition explanation, arguing explicitly that people plan for the future and make rational decisions about having children in all times and places. People are people. One group is not more rational than another. They just make their decisions, to the extent that they behave in this rational way, in varying religious, economic, and social contexts. In one time and place, powerful extended lineage kin groups may control much of life and provide strong practical incentives to have many children. In another time and place, most family groups may be small, weak, and at the mercy of powerful non-family forces such as corporations that demand devotion to their own goals of production and that provide no incentive, but rather penalties, for spending time on children instead of pursuing those corporate goals. Equally rational behavior in different contexts leads to different outcomes, in this case, different birth rate outcomes. Finally, the fourth mistake that Mason thinks we make in trying to explain fertility decline concerns the time scale in which we look for causes and their effects. We can't expect, she says, to be able to predict that as soon as the right combination of explanatory factors are piled up together on one side of the balance scale, the balance will start to shift and the birth rate will start to fall. We can't predict exactly when this process will start, not in a time scale of a month or a year, or even, she believes, in a particular decade. She quotes Griffith Feeney, who pointed out that although we know that earthquakes are caused by the shifting of tectonic plates, that doesn't mean that we know the hour, the day, or even the year when an earthquake will actually occur. Thus, some studies of fertility decline in particular countries may find only a loose correspondence between the supposed explanatory causes of fertility decline and the actual birth rate trends. She singles out in particular the massive research study called the Princeton European Fertility Project, 
which found only this kind of weak and inconsistent connection between economic modernization and fertility decline in different parts of the continent. Her evaluation of this research boils down to saying that the Princeton researchers didn't have enough of the complex list of possible explanations and moderating conditions included in their model. But even if they had included 10 times as many predictors, if Mason is right in her critical mass approach to such explanations, and if Feeney is right about this being like trying to predict earthquakes, we are not going to find a nice, simple, consistent universal theory to account for every case of falling birth rates. Having made these four points, Mason then turns to her final discussion, trying to sum up what she thinks the overall explanatory framework should consider in order to deal with such diversity of contexts and the variety of explanatory factors that can combine to yield a critical mass that will start fertility decline. Pointing out the weaknesses of previous explanations for lower birth rates, Mason is faced with the job of putting together her own synthesis of all these ideas. Her resulting model for trying to explain fertility decline incorporates features of all the other approaches and tries to make them work together. First of all, she stresses her critical mass idea that no one feature of society or process of social change can do all this explaining by itself. It requires some combination of such factors to trigger fertility decline. She also tries to find some order in the diverse ways that this decline seems to have come about by referring to different world regions. The idea is that something about different regions may lend itself to different paths of fertility decline. She doesn't spell out exactly how we should identify these different regions of the world, where the boundaries between them might be, or what it is about each region that suggests a different path for fertility decline. But we can have more than just a vague suspicion that the underlying factor separating these regions from each other is probably a long-standing historical difference in basic features of culture. A good example would be the Confucian tradition of viewing hierarchy as a natural feature of life, including family life. Viewing hierarchies of both gender and generation, and even of birth order, as not only natural, but vital to proper social harmony. This tradition characterizes many societies in East Asia, and East Asia therefore could be one of the regions she is talking about. Sub-Saharan African cultures, despite their great diversity in many respects, also often share a distinctive system of kinship relations that differs from kinship systems founding neighboring regions like Europe or the Middle East. Mason even specifically mentions the demographic consequences of this difference, more emphasis on many children and less concern with controlling the intimate lives of women in the African kinship system than in its, than in its neighbors. Within such regions, Mason suggests that one society usually has to lead the way into the process of fertility decline. For these pioneer societies in each region, she seems to think that the mainstream transition theory linked to economic development and increasing prosperity probably tells most of the story of how and why birth rates begin to fall. Other neighboring societies, however, can borrow both attitudes and behavior related to lower fertility from the pioneering society, sometimes without having to wait for the same process of economic development. In fact, the mainstream development explanation only has to work once, for example, in Northwestern Europe, and then it is conceivable that borrowing and diffusion could be part of the picture for all other societies, even the pioneer societies in other world regions. Fertility decline does in fact spread throughout a region, however, doesn't depend only on the objective situation of economic progress or the availability of a neighboring society from which to borrow ideas and behavior. Falling birth rates also depend on institutional factors that vary from one society to another, from the nature and power of extended kinship lineages to religious attitudes about birth and contraception, and from the power and motivation of governments to organize family planning programs to the opportunities for geographic and social mobility. As already noted, though, Mason does find one common denominator that always seems to be part of the mix of causes for fertility decline. The figures shown here document her claim that lower infant mortality apparently is a necessary requirement for lower birth rates, even if it can't bring down those birth rates all by itself. This figure is a little unusual because the time sequence for each country runs from upper right to lower left as both infant mortality and total fertility rates decline together.
In fact, the priority of the infant mortality decline is plainly visible in the figure, since for most countries shown, the lines plotting the course of change fall nearly straight down at first. This means infant mortality was declining, but the birth rate had not yet started to fall. Only after the infant mortality rate dropped down below about 100 deaths for every 1,000 live births, about 10% mortality for infants, do we see the fertility rate also starting to shift to the left, to lower levels. Below this 10% threshold for infant mortality, all countries studied follow the same diagonal path with lower birth rates paralleling the fall in infant death rates. Mason then singles out one feature of cultural differences for special attention. These differences probably refer back to her distinction between different world regions. The special difference that she singles out concerns traditional beliefs about the ideal number of children. Some cultures definitely have different ideas about this than others. In particular, Mason points out that in Europe, the traditional ideal number of children was never very large, even long before anything like the Industrial Revolution or the demographic transition ever got started. This long-standing variation in cultural ideals creates different settings within which people are thinking about having children. And such differences in cultural context are one and such differences in cultural context are one important reason, according to Mason, for why fertility decline follows different paths in different societies, even though all people reflect rationally on what would be best for them to do. The influence of Jack Caldwell on her thinking is particularly obvious in this respect. Once people do start to think critically about problems that may go along with too many children, how and when do they do something about it? This is where the variety of human experiences across the globe really start to cause trouble for any overall theory of fertility decline. Mason makes the very important point that if children start to become problematic, there are a number of ways to deal with this problem, and not all of them involve contraceptives or later marriage or other forms of fertility control. She uses the interesting and even a little horrifying term offspring control to describe this wider range of possible solutions. The distinction between offspring control and fertility control also sometimes appears euphemistically in references to postnatal versus prenatal controls. Put more simply, postnatal controls are positive checks, solutions that occur after birth. A number of cultures around the world can look back to historical resort to infanticide. In ancient China, there are records of drowning or burying unwanted children. In ancient Greece, the Spartans in particular exposed unwanted infants, simply denying them any of the intensive care without which no human newborn can survive. In Mason's attempt at scientifically neutral language on this point, she describes new social rules against infanticide as a shift from postnatal to prenatal controls, and describes the rules and moral condemnation of infanticide as increased social costs of using the older methods. There are less horrifying postnatal controls, however, that can be used at least at the local level to deal with the increasing costs and inconveniences of children. Not all such controls are positive checks, as we will see in future readings. For example, another way to get rid of excess children is for them simply to move off to some other place. If migration is available as a solution, this postpones the days that families caught up in the complex processes of modernization must begin to control fertility. So long as some of these children disappear over the horizon for new lives someplace else, people can go on having as many children as they did before. All of these considerations lead Mason to systematize what she calls her interactive approach to understanding fertility transitions. This interaction occurs among all the different previous explanations that she considered at the beginning of her article. From them, she concludes that all fertility transitions are alike in at least one respect. All of them require that somehow death rates must begin to decline first, and in particular that death rates of infants must begin to decline. This can happen due to a wide range of factors, from economic development and prosperity to the diffusion of better medical care into a society, or even from outlawing infanticide. This factor seems to be necessary for birth rates to fall. The other feature that always seems to show up in the fertility transitions that she studied is a reduction in the number of children that people consider to be ideal. No matter how widely this ideal number of children may vary from one cultural region to another, 
fertility decline does not seem to get started in any region or any society in that region until this ideal begins to change, until people start to perceive that something is starting to seem problematic about traditional family sizes. In all other respects, though, fertility transitions seem to vary in a bewildering diversity of ways. It is a little like the old saying that all happy people are happy in the same way, but that unhappy people are all unhappy for different reasons. In some regions like Western Europe, gender stratification was never as strong as in some other parts of the world, so the reproductive behavior of women was not as tightly regulated as in other regions making it easier for them to begin having fewer children when this started to seem rational to them. In both Europe and East Asia, the option of having some of the surplus children simply move away was also an option, meaning that birth rates did not have to respond immediately to changes such as economic development and rising prosperity in some cases. And of course, some societies have made greater efforts than others to provide the information and technical means needed for women to prevent pregnancies and this has an obvious effect on numbers of children born. The complicated diagram that Mason includes as her summary in figure one of how all these ideas fit together illustrates very well just how complicated a real explanation has to be in order to do a good job of explaining why birth rates fall in societies all around the world. You might easily spend several years of your life just to get a solid understanding of all these connections and conditions in figure one. Certainly, it took her several decades of thinking to get to the point that she was ready to make this figure as part of this article. But even if you don't puzzle out every single detail of how her model works and what all the pieces of it mean, it is easy to take away the main message of her argument. There is not just one simple version of the fertility transition from high to low birth rates. There is not just one script or plot for this important change that has reshaped some societies so completely and that is still just getting started in others.